All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Duralit Sedlix. Today, we will be talking about a very special topic, which is the indigenous peoples, their long struggle for legal recognition and ongoing strive to have that recognition adequately enforced. We will be joined by an absolute expert on the topic who will discuss some of the core and some of the emerging issues that indigenous peoples around the world have to deal with. Medes Malejolo, a PhD researcher at the University of Groningen, who studies legal aspects of the lives of indigenous peoples, and who is, by the way, arguably one of the best people to address the topic of indigenous peoples in Groningen. By the way, before we start, I would also like to point out there is a surprise waiting for all of you listeners at the end of the episode, so stay tuned. Before we jump into our discussion, Eva has prepared some general facts about the indigenous peoples around the world. Let's have a listen. Indigenous peoples are distinct social and cultural groups that share collective ancestral ties to the lands and natural resources where they live, occupy, or from which they have been displaced. The land and natural resources on which they depend on are inextricably linked to their identities, cultures, livelihoods, as well as their physical and spiritual well-being. There are 476 million indigenous people currently living around the world that spread across more than 90 countries. They belong to more than 5,000 different indigenous peoples and speak more than 4,000 languages. Although they have different customs and cultures, they often face the same harsh commonalities. Evictions from their ancestral lands, being denied the opportunity to express their culture, physical attacks and treatment as second-class citizens. Indigenous peoples are often last to receive public investment in basic services and infrastructure and face multiple barriers to participate fully in the economy, enjoy the right to access justice and participate in political processes and decision making. This legacy of inequality and exclusion furthermore has made indigenous peoples more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and natural disasters. Thanks Eva for this super useful insight and for offering us such a good prompt to start off our episode. On that note, let me first express our gratitude for having you here, Midas. I am honestly very, very, very genuinely looking forward to our discussion today. Before we start, however, could you please give me a quick scoop on what you're working on in your research, please? What I'm working on in my research is basically, well, the rights of indigenous peoples, especially the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples, which is foundational to them. And I basically analyze that through the lens of the obligations of the state. So as soon as a state has an indigenous people, the question is what can be expected from a state. Is it on any particular communities or indigenous peoples in general? Who do you study? Well, the PhD project actually consists out of three parts. Mm -hmm. And the first part is a very theoretic part, so very, very uh, theory based. The second part is then moving on to the right to self-determination itself. And the third part is basically about two case studies where all of the theory is then illustrated. Mm -hmm. And the two case studies concern the Sami people in Sweden, Norway and Finland. And the other case study concerns uh, a case study of two indigenous peoples in, in East Indonesia. Uh, the Alifuru and uh, the Papuans. Okay, that sounds very cool, and we're going to come back to that in a second. But let's start from the beginning, right? Let's go back to the definition. Who are indigenous peoples? Who are we referring to when we're using that term? And more importantly also, how is it possible to have so many people, so many communities, under one specific term? Basically, a people concerns a particular group that shares particular features, history, language, anything. Those features can basically be identified in an objective manner. However, in order to be qualified as what we call then a people, so a group in the sense of a people, that group also needs to identify themselves as such. So there also needs to be this subjective element. Now that is a very, very broad definition of what is a people, but then what an indigenous people is, is basically that, but then the people has a special relationship with their ancestral land. And the more unique that relationship is with their ancestral lands, the more you could say that they are indigenous. And there are different definitions of uh, indigenous people. Some scholars, they, they refer to indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants. But what you can identify the most for these groups uh, is the fact that they, they have this, this, what we then call this special relationship with their mm -hmm. ancestral lands. That is what makes them indigenous. But is there an authoritative definition or it really depends on scholars or the peoples themselves, how they identify? It, well, first of all, the law doesn't say anything about this. Okay, uh, interesting. International law doesn't say anything about 
uh, doesn't give any definition about people or uh, an indigenous people. And that makes sense because international law is mainly created by states mm -hmm. and, and states are very careful in um, making those definitions, etc. Now, when it comes to the definition of being a people, most of the uh, definitions need to be found outside of the law, outside of the realm of the law, international law. And we rely a lot upon anthropological studies in that sense. Jumping just a quick thought on anthropology, you mentioned some case studies, right? Is that going to take an interdisciplinary approach to it when you're going to go there to, I guess, observe and then learn and write a PhD on it? Or is it going to be strictly legal methodology? In my case, no. Okay. In my case, no. Um, and the reason for that is a very clear one. I'm a lawyer and not an anthropologist. I've been schooled as a, as a lawyer uh, in a traditional manner here in Europe and not as an anthropologist. However, given the fact that you study the law and that you study the rights of indigenous people, you can reflect upon that and actually then make propositions and say, well, we need more studies on, on this and this and that. And perhaps we need more studies on this from an anthropological perspective. But mainly speaking, no, uh, I'm not going into the realm of uh, anthropology in that sense because you know, that's my limitation as a, as a scholar. Okay, fair enough. As we mentioned in the beginning, as Eva mentioned, there are 476-ish million of indigenous peoples around the world spread across more than 90 countries. Now, from your presentation, what we've heard so far, you're focusing on three specific uh, communities, right? Two in East Indonesia, and then one in well, Scandinavia, broadly. Could you tell us a tiny bit more about those communities? How come you chose specifically those three for your research? And how come such vastly different communities, mainly talking about in terms of geography, can share such similar problems in reality that need to be addressed by a very similar legal protection? Well, as for East Indonesia, I am from indigenous descent. I'm from Alifuru descent. So the choice of, of that particular case study or this particular indigenous people in the case study was quite straightforward uh, because of the personal connection to it and also because of the, the knowledge that you then also have. And then the Papua ones, because it's there are several equivalents between these peoples. It's also not geographically not mm -hmm. so far away. Because the Alifuru, they live on the island of Seram and surrounding, uh, surrounding islands. And these islands are also known as the former Spice Islands. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays also known as the South Moluccans. But uh, as soon as you talk to the people there, who are your ancestors? Where do they come from? They say from the mountains of, uh, of Seram, uh, which is then according to the indigenous qualification called Nusa Ina, which is called the, uh, the mother island. So it is basically that all people from the neighboring islands, they come from this mother island, uh, the island of Seram. But then uh, you jump to Scandinavia. Then I jump to Scandinavia. Why? Because for my case studies, I'm using my case studies as illustrations to show how the right to self-determination works. But this is heavily context dependent. Now, why, the, why then jump to Scandinavia? The reason for that is that, that it is a completely different context. In this case, we're talking about regulating one people, one indigenous people, and the state has needs to, to regulate the, the right to self-determination for one indigenous people. But these people, they live in, in different, different states. They live in uh, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, but also Russia. So it, it's a completely different context. Compare that to the context of Indonesia, then you're talking about one state many, many, many indigenous people. So basically the idea is to show with these case studies how context dependent the right to self-determination is and to show this this particular normative scale and, 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 and to show, okay, when when are we in the red zone, when when are we in the in the yellow zone or the orange zone or in the green zone? When you're going to be researching about the Sami, are you going to be looking at them from the point of view of the Swedish, the Finnish, the Norwegian administration? Because you mentioned the um, relationship between the indigenous peoples in the state. Yeah. So from all three of them. Yeah. Yeah. In particular, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And the reason for that is because the states have already been negotiating with each other as regards regulating the rights of this indigenous population. They are actually already drafted the convention called the Draft Nordic Sami Convention. Very interesting treaty to actually look at. Still underemphasized in legal doctrine. But yeah, for my LLM thesis, I took the challenge to actually analyze that. And against that backdrop, I decided to move things and to say, okay, let's take this, this case study and compare that to uh, the case study of Indonesia. 
That's really cool. By the way, just to actually go back to one of the questions from before, we talked about now how vastly different these communities are. But why would you say the harsh reality is that even though they are so far apart on the planet, they still face quite similar problems in one aspect? Why would you say that is? They, they have this special relationship with their ancestral lands, and that is what makes them very vulnerable. Most of the time, it is part of the special relationship is one particular future, some sometimes more futures, which then takes part of the, what we call their collective identity. Now, as soon as their collective identity then is at stake, their uh, viability, but also their survival is at stake. A very good example, take the Sami. Part of their collective identity is reindeer herding. Reindeers take a very important part in their uh, traditional way of life and also take a very, very uh, important role in their uh, collective identity. Take away that, the viability, the survival is at stake. And that is something that you can see all around the world as regards indigenous peoples. They have this special relationship with their ancestral lands and the more unique and the stronger that relationship is, the more vulnerable they, they are. Now, international law recognizes that and protects them in that sense. Wrapping up with the cultural, geographical and typographical aspects, I think it's now time to turn towards some more legal, legal historical aspects of our topic. Eva, what have you prepared for us on the topic of the history of the legal recognition of indigenous peoples? The rights of indigenous peoples were latecomers to the process of building up the international edifice for the recognition, protection and promotion of human rights. It was for a long time held that the situation of indigenous peoples was solely the concern of states and that as long as governments adhered to the general principles of universal individual human rights, there was no role or responsibility for the UN. This changed in the 1970s when indigenous peoples, some government delegates and UN experts drew attention to the continuing human rights problems facing indigenous peoples in a number of countries. As pointed out by Eva, the struggle for legal recognition of indigenous peoples started already in the 1970s. So what is the situation? What does the situation look like today? It is what are the legal instruments, if any, that are relevant for the protection of indigenous peoples and what is their scope? From a legal perspective, significant improvement. 2007, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted. And back then, there were a couple of states that did not support the adoption. It's Alia, Canada, uh, Australia and New Zealand. However, the years after that, they changed their positions and they actually uh, supported the adoption of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Some of the important countries, I would say, yeah. in terms of indigenous yeah. populations. Yeah. Yeah, very, uh, very, uh, indeed, very, very important, uh, important ones because they have indigenous peoples. Uh, New Zealand, with the Maori, Australia, of course, Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders. And the Torres Strait Islanders must not be forgotten. Many, many people, they all around the world, but also within Australia, they don't even know that there are two indigenous peoples in uh, in Australia. Uh, so you have the Aboriginals, but also the Torres Strait Islanders in uh, mm -hmm. in the north in the, in the Torres Strait between Papua New Guinea and Australia. And of course, then Canada with uh, many indigenous people in their territory. So very important to have those states on board as well as regards the creation of norms and mm -hmm. the support of, uh, of this, uh, this legal framework. Now, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is also referred to as the UNDRIP, it was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. And that means it's not binding. However, it reflects very important, uh, important norms that have been codified in uh, human rights treaties but also customary international law. So the thing is, states can say, uh, well, the, 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 the UNDRIP is not binding, etc. this and this and that, and they do actually in FORA, they actually say that uh, within the United Nations, some states, they actually say that. And then there are al always these, these, uh, these experts on the rights of indigenous peoples al always intervening and always saying, yeah, but that is an oversimplification. International law is way more complex than that. And the UNDRIP basically reflects customary international law and already existing law. When we talk about custom international law, we know that during the emergence of it, we can have objectors, objecting states. In this case, do we have any objecting states? We already mentioned that some, some countries didn't want to ratify the convention in the first place. They did afterwards, but in terms of customary international law, are there any objectors? Well, arguably, uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, back then, uh, during the adoption of, uh, of the UNDRIP, but nowadays, it, it's, it's more difficult to construct an argument uh, that the UNDRIP is, is, is not uh, reflecting already existing law, and in particular then also customary international law. I have to say that then, again, that depends on which provisions you're, you're analyzing. So when it comes, to, for instance, to the provisions related to the right to self-determination, very clear, 
already exist in customary international law. But when it comes to other provisions, that might not be the case per se. So that requires an inductive uh, analysis, uh, analyzing state practice first and then opinion juris. And then also taking into consideration the, uh, the elements of persistent objectives, for instance. But yeah, that's interesting. Perhaps interesting for those, uh, for those students interested in the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, try to take a look at the UNRIP, try to take a look at the particular provision and figure out whether that reflects customary international law or not, whether that is still controversial. And oh, perhaps you have LNM or, or LLB thesis topic. Are there any cool ICJ or even national cases that you would point out in this aspect in terms of having a case in front of an international national court on indigenous rights? Yeah, a very recent one, Billy Aol versus Australia. That was a uh, view by the uh, Human Rights Committee. Very well known one nowadays because recently the Human Rights Committee basically said that Australia is, is violating uh, uh, the rights of uh, the Torres Strait Islanders under Article 27 of the ICPR, which relate to uh, minority rights, for not having taken sufficient measures against climate change. So basically the problem is, is that the Torres Strait Islands, the islands basically sinking and Basically, they started a case against the Australian government, first domestically within the framework of the state, and then uh, they moved on to Human Rights Committee, which is the supervising body of the uh, ICCPR, the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And you can actually start an individual complaint procedure there, as long as the state has ratified the optional protocol to the uh, ICCPR. And they did, and, and basically the Human Rights Committee said, uh, well, Australia, you have to do more. That's interesting that you pointed out that the case was about minority rights. Because if we go back in history, that's actually how the whole conversation of indigenous rights came about, right? They first mentioned it in terms of minority discrimination. That's how it was started to be lobbied as, or at least that's how it was first mentioned, if I'm correct. And yeah. then it became its own thing. Yeah, there, there, is, a, there is an overlap between the two, the two concepts. And, and the minority is one thing. Indigenous people is another thing. And there is an overlap because there are many indigenous peoples around the world who also form a minority within the state. However, not all indigenous peoples form a minority. People in Fiji, for instance, can say that they are indigenous, but they're not a minority in Fiji, right? The two concepts are different. Now, indigenous peoples, again, when it comes to indigenous peoples, it's about that special relationship that they have with their ancestral lands. A minority, on the other hand, it's, can be completely different. But what you see most of the time is that indigenous peoples, they, they use the framework of minority rights because they also form a minority. And now specifically under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICPR, we have Article 27, which regulates the rights, the minority rights, the rights of persons belonging to a minority. And that opens the door then for persons belonging to that minority to actually start complaining and to start a procedure as long as their state has ratified the optional protocol. So in terms of legal uh, enforcement, they would go for a different yeah. legal basis? Yeah, the legal basis mm. then would be the Article 27 of the ICPR. And then basically the idea is that Article 27 of the ICPR protects the minority, protects the, the cultural rights of people belonging to a minority, because as soon as that is affected, the community is affected, but also these persons. So there's this relationship between an individual belonging to the group, but also the group and the individual. That's also a very good cue for my next question. You mentioned in the beginning of our interview that your research focuses specifically on self-determination of indigenous peoples. And I want to actually ask you to elaborate a bit more on this concept, because we've had a previous conversation and you mentioned that you look at two aspects of self-determination, rather the internal versus external, I remember correctly, but before we go to that, can you just briefly explain what this concept entails in theory, how it can be implemented in practice, is it legally binding and by whom can it be enforced? The right to self-determination is a, first of all the right of the people, that means that it is a collective right, so it's not an individual one, mm -hmm. the right of a people, and in this case an, an indigenous people. At its very core, the right to self-determination basically entails the legal entitlement of a people, of in this case an indigenous people, to freely make choices on matters that significantly affect them. Now, at its very core, that means that as soon as 
particular topic, a particular theme affects their collective identity, they need to have a seat at the table. Now, that very idea can take its manifestation in two ways, either in an internal manner or external manner. And this is what we call internal self-determination and external self-determination. External self-determination developed basically after World War II because suddenly we saw a lot of new states declaring themselves independent based on the right to self-determination. Now, this dimension of self-determination, the external one, then developed more and more and more. Now, external self-determination basically refers to the idea of independence, the idea of establishing your own state. So exercising your right to self-determination, your legal entitlement to freely make choices on matters that significantly affect you against the rest of the world. The internal dimension, however, has to do with basically that idea of freely making choices on matters that significantly affect you within the legal framework of the state, within the institutional framework of the state. That is what we call internal self-determination. Now, after the decolonization process, the internal dimension of the right to self-determination developed yeah, more and more and more, and more emphasis was put on, on that. However, we still have many questions as to what it exactly entails. We know that it entails a particular degree of autonomy or perhaps self-governance, etc., within the state. But what does it exactly entail and more specifically what, what can be expected from the state? Now, a very good example can be found in the framework of the rights of indigenous peoples. Because this dimension of the right to self-determination, the internal one, has been further developed within this framework. Now, what you can see then is that it is more of a procedural right. So as soon as decisions are being made by the state, within the state, that affect the collective identity of an indigenous people, they need to have a saying on the matter and they need to be on board. They need to uh, have a seat at the table. Now, more concretely, that could take form of what we then call free prior and informed consent. And this is a particular right that indigenous peoples have because as soon as their, uh, their interests their collective identity is, uh, is at stake, they need to give their free, prior and informed consent. Now, this is in legal scholarship somewhat controversial because states are very, very careful in that sense because they say they see it as a, as a veto. They see it as a veto where, where development projects, for instance, can be turned down by indigenous peoples saying that their collective identity is at stake and then the whole project can be, uh, can be abolished. Now, in practice, this actually kind of happened here in Europe recently uh, in Norway, where one of the biggest wind farm parks in, in Norway, the, the permit for that wind farm park basically was declared as uh, null and void by the Supreme Court of, of Norway. Why? Because basically the, the wind farm park was affecting uh, reindeer herding and affecting, in this case then, the rights of, uh, of the Sami, in particular their minority rights, protected under Article 27 of the ICC. Could you tell us a bit more about the enforcement? Because we have this convention, but it's binding only on states. So let's say you belong to indigenous peoples in a country, but your state doesn't have an internal framework on which you can rely on. What can you do as an individual? Who can you sue in front of where? Uh, yeah, that depends on the framework of the state. First of all, international law protects indigenous peoples, but then it's up to the states to actually guarantee that protection. Now, this is exactly what I'm also researching, because from a regulatory perspective, well, the minimum uh, human rights protection needs to be uh, needs to be guaranteed also for indigenous peoples. So then the question becomes: Okay, does that mean a particular state apparatus? Does that mean a recognition of indigenous peoples in the constitution? Well, it actually does. Because as soon as there is constitutional recognition, there is this foundation for further protection, also by law. And this is what you see nowadays also in Australia, where in Australia there is this movement going on for recognition of the indigenous peoples within the constitution. And actually the indigenous peoples, the aboriginals and the Torres Strait Islanders, they, they have invited the population uh, in Australia to go on this road and take them, take them with them. Yeah, and it's also, I think, important to mention the vast differences that we can see in different national administrations. If we mention, at least in my view, New Zealand, I think they're very progressive. Yeah, New Zealand is considered as one of the most best examples, one of the good practices. However, 
there are still some issues that in New Zealand also can be addressed and actually New Zealand can also learn from other states in that regard, especially when it comes to the balance of power. However, New Zealand is very well known for being ahead, generations ahead of the rest of the world when it comes to uh, the protection of the rights of indigenous peoples. The reason for that is also because Maori, indigenous people in Aotearoa, New Zealand, they actually were very resilient and they actually took up the initiative to protect their language and, and, and set up their own schools and to protect their, uh, their culture and their collective identity. Are there uh, any other good practices that you could point out? Any particular different Yeah, education. Things? Education in oh. New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, education in New Zealand. In New Zealand, the Maori, they are also very well known with rugby and also known for the haka. Mm-hmm. Now, imagine that in New Zealand, there are actually haka schools. Wonderful. So that shows how important education in that sense is in, in, in society and the indigenous education is. And also these schools are also established by the Maori themselves. Now this is then a concrete manifestation of self-determination. Being able to establish your own schools, being able to freely make choices on matters that significantly affect you, in this case education. And that is very important. Why? Because indigenous peoples, before international law protected them, actually education was against them. A- education was used as a means to actually, well, hyphen that, civilize the population, sent them to boarding schools, sent them to, to uh, civilized schools. Education was actually used as a means to destroy collective identity. International law nowadays protects them, and we acknowledge, by law, in law, in international law, we acknowledge that education is very important. Now, for that, you n- they need to be able to establish their schools themselves and also have a saying on, on the curriculum, etc. The state has to support that. On the topic of different legal issues that indigenous peoples might face, Eva prepared some other examples from around the world that can be, I think, very illustrative to hear at this point. In many parts of the world, indigenous peoples' right to lands, territories and resources remain limited or unrecognized. Even where there is legal support, implementation is frequently stalled or inconsistent. For example, in Paraguay, the Yaqui Asha lost their historic lands to state development and corporate land grabs, resulting in economic hardship, hunger, displacement and violence. Due to large-scale soy farmers and cattle ranchers that claimed the land, the indigenous community was resettled as part of a development program in Paraguay. As a traditional community of hunter-gatherers, the lands to which they were displaced made them unable to live within their traditional means of subsistence seen as the natural environment and resources were different from their traditional territory. In Australia, for example, major discrimination against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, like being unfairly denied a job or unfairly discouraged from continuing education, remains at elevated levels and is far higher than for the rest of the population, according to new data. While everyone remembers the recent discovery of more than 1,300 unmarked graves at the site of four former residential schools in Western Canada. Indigenous peoples are also the first communities to be impacted by climate change. In Africa's Kalahari Desert, the indigenous communities are for example forced to live around government drilled bores for water and depend on government support for their survival due to rising temperatures, while indigenous peoples in the Arctic region that depend on hunting of polar bears, walrus, seals, etc., face the issue of the change in species and availability of traditional food sources. Now, these are just some of the examples that we picked for today's podcast, but we can assure you that there are thousands of stories like these out there. A question to you, Medis, what is your reflection on what has just been presented? Maybe in terms of personal thoughts, but also on some legal issues, because we heard something on land rights, property rights, we heard something about discrimination, we heard something about climate change. What are your general thoughts? General thoughts are that that special relationship that makes them indigenous is also makes them very vulnerable but at the same time also very powerful they have the knowledge how do we address climate change ask the aboriginals i would say <laughs> they've been living there for 65,000 years <laughs> a, a scholar once wrote that if you take australia and see australia as a clock 12 hour clock only the last few minutes on the clock be representing Australia as we know nowadays. All of that before was Aboriginals. How to deal with climate change, how to deal with your environment, ask indigenous peoples. Now this is very important, I would say. And nowadays, actually, as in today, there are very, very, very uh, recent developments going on. Currently, there are these conferences going on in Montreal, right? Regarding uh, biodiversity. Actually, 
now, I've read it in the newspaper today, it was published here in the, the Netherlands in the NRC. There are plans now to give indigenous peoples a platform to reflect upon that and try to give them a platform, guarantee more participation from them on the international level. Now, I would argue then that that also has a legal basis. Why? Because when we talk about self-determination, when we talk about matters that significantly affect them, that is not limited to only instance, participation within decision-making procedures within the state, but perhaps also on the international level. And there are some scholars who actually say that, who actually say that based on the right to self-determination, indigenous peoples also have a right to participate in international decision-making processes and in the lawmaking itself. Now, this is then a good example that you see as regards participation. I think that is very valuable. Governments can learn a lot from that. The idea is basically that there needs to be more engagement with indigenous peoples. You can see that, generally speaking, indigenous peoples are very open to that. They want to establish this relationship. And that is also what the right to self-determination entails in that sense. It's about relation. It's not about separation. It's about uh, the relationship between the state and an indigenous people. They want to have this relationship, but it's now up to the governments to actually engage with that. You see these, these developments going on more and more and more, and I think also society contributes to that in the, in the sense that the media also puts more focus on that. Also students, individuals, students especially also contribute to that. The youth as well. Yeah, I was going to say, do you think the rise in social media and the fact that more people have access to individuals spreading media. Do you think that has helped indigenous people in that often people aren't going to major newspapers or major news outlets to get information? They're now going to people that are affected and the people that are in the situation. Do you think this has helped ind yeah. indigenous people? Yeah, definitely. Indigenous peoples have their own podcasts as well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they do. We're not they special. Do. So they, they shouldn't do. listen to us. You should go to the source. <laughs> They do, they do. <laughs> and it's actually fascinating because representatives of indigenous peoples, they uh, they gather around, uh, go to conferences, and then they uh, make presentations and they, they actually record themselves and have these panels, record those as well, and have these podcasts too, where representatives of indigenous peoples uh, talk with each other and uh, indigenous advocates, they share thoughts and share traditional knowledge and share strategies, how to deal with, uh, with these things. Fascinating. I actually have a follow-up question to this because I am really for the fact that indigenous peoples themselves, of course, are the ones to be heard. We, uh, we can be mainly a facilitator, but it's them who need to come up and voice their own desires and wishes, objectives, all of that. But in media, we can quite often see examples of indigenous people, activists or whistleblowers that then face a harsh reality of very harsh violence or sometimes even death when they decide to speak up against their own national administrations. I think one of the big examples is Brazil. How would you tell somebody to speak up? And I know it's a very dear topic if you face such difficult aspects like punishment after. This is exactly why knowledge about international law is so important. Because it protects them. It's there. It says of obligations. Indigenous peoples, they have human rights. Persons belonging to indigenous peoples, they have human rights. They are specifically protected by the norms, by these legal standards, reflected in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The international law is there to protect them. But do you think there's a divide between theory and practice? Yeah, definitely. Is it effective? That's the next question then. Is it effective? You can put your question marks there. But that also is an inherent problem in international law itself, the enforcement. When we talk about indigenous peoples, it's a very concrete example of a particular topic as regards international standards that we have in the world. But then when it comes to the enforcement, how effective is it then? That That's an enforcement problem that we, that we have. Why? Because the law is made by states and enforced by states. There is no police, international police. There is no international legislator. There is no international true absolute judge. Yeah, we have these, 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 these organs coming very close to it, like the uh, General Assembly and... Security Council and uh, the ICJ, etc. But there is no true trias politica. There is no international police force who enforces these norms. So it's up to states themselves to then then deal with that. So yeah, that that is a problem. Is it effective? Yeah, you can put your question marks there. But that doesn't mean that the law is irrelevant. It is actually relevant, and knowledge about that is very important because it's there to protect those who are vulnerable. And I think that is what 
we as legal scholars, but also as what well, students of the law also also need to do. In that sense, I would say that a moral responsibility to put these uh, these matters on the agenda. But it all starts with knowledge in that sense. I always tell students, before you play the game of chess, how do you know to checkmate your opponent in the very first turn? Well, we all know that you cannot do that because you have to move the pawns first, but how do you know that? Because you know the rules. You know the rules, you know what which moves each piece takes. Based on the rules, you're not allowed to just move your queen across the board. Right? Start with the rules, start with the knowledge, that's foundational. And that's why we have you here today to teach us some of the fundamentals. Now, drawing some conclusions from our whole discussion, what would you say are going to be some major challenges that indigenous peoples face in the future? Or what are some positive developments that we can expect? Do you think that the systemic oppression that has been plaguing indigenous peoples for centuries can be tackled in the near future? Challenges, yeah, a lot has to do with the enforcement. The law is clearly there, but when it comes to the enforcement, that's uh, most of the time also problematic. Also is the fact that there is quite a huge distance between indigenous people and international law. The norms are clearly there, but with some indigenous communities, they don't know about that. And also a challenge is the clash between then also international law and the customs of particular indigenous cultures. Some indigenous practices could be violating human rights under the framework that we know nowadays as under international human rights law. Those are also challenges, how to deal with that, how to balance these, these matters. Good reflections, I would say nowadays international law protects indigenous people, whereas before the introduction of the current human rights system that we know nowadays after World War II, fall of that international law was actually very violent against indigenous people. Uh, matters such as uh, doctrines of conquest. Terra nullius. Indigenous peoples. Yeah. 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 They're not really part of the community. They need. They are not civilized. International law was quite violent. But after World War II, nowadays we know uh, international human rights system. And actually what you see is that international law protects them and the indigenous peoples also are m- more aware of that these days. So I think that is a that, that is a very 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 good thing, and then also especially those states that actually uh, can be considered as good practices. Look at New Zealand, but also look at uh, Norway, uh, Sweden, and Finland in particular. Then Norway, I would say, look at how the rights of indigenous peoples is regulated there. It's far from perfect, far from perfect, but there are good practices going around. I have like a follow-up question. I just wanted to ask because we mentioned that on the international plane. We have vastly different communities from around the world that fall under the definition of an indigenous peoples. Do you think in terms of or in the sake of getting that voice on an international plane, also indigenous peoples as different communities should come together as well? Because I can see it, it being very difficult if you're from Eastern Indonesia, if you're from the Arctic region, if you're from the rainforest and Amazon to get in touch and actually come up with a strategy to help yourself as a whole community of indigenous peoples? They do already. Okay. They do already. There's this United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues where indigenous representatives, they, they gather together, where they also draft resolutions. There's the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, also under the framework of the United Nations. Now the expert mechanism, the uh, MRIP, also makes reports And in the making of those reports, they also consult human rights institutions, national human rights institutions, but also indigenous peoples themselves. Take, for instance, the Sami. They receive information from, for instance, the Sami parliaments, because that is striking in Norway, Sweden and Finland. The Sami are represented in their own separate parliaments, called the Sami parliaments. And, for instance, then the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples also gathers, gets information from them. That happened, actually, after during COVID. So uh, during COVID, there were these discussions going on in the expert mechanism as regards the impact of COVID and also in other in other fora regarding indigenous issues. But there also, the expert mechanism also received information from the Sami parliaments and the same accounts for the special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous people. There's also the special rapporteur who also can do fact-finding, uh, studying uh, reports on a particular issue, particular theme 
any any uh, rights that has to do with indigenous peoples, but also it can make a report on a particular country. And actually, the special rapporteur did that also, for instance, for New Zealand. So if you're interested in that, you can easily look it up, report on uh, New Zealand and the Maori from the uh, special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples. When we first talked about your research, you said you were researching indigenous peoples from the Scandinavia. And I immediately went from what I've seen ages ago on Discovery Channel or something like that. I said, oh, you mean the Lapland people? And he told me, excuse me, that is actually not the term that you should be using. It is the Sami. No. Please tell us something about that. Uh, well, Lapland and Laplanders, it has this discriminatory connotation. The original traditional qualification of the people is the Sami. And they experienced a lot of discrimination and the term has this, this connotation. But also the Sami people are very well aware of the importance of qualification. And why is that? Because qualification by the people themselves has to do with what we call self-identification. And self-identification is a very, a very, a very important aspect of determining a group as a people and in particular as an indigenous people. Just to summarize this, the more you come to the very core of the collective identity of an indigenous people, the more you can make an argument that they are an indigenous people. Self-identification is very important in that sense. As soon as an indigenous community starts to qualify themselves as foreigners did, but not the way how their ancestors did, for instance, that special relationship with the ancestral land is affected in a particular way. So that creates obstacles for this subjective element of being an indigenous people. So in order to get legal recognition, it's actually a double-staged yeah. test. Yeah, so yeah. in order for it to be an indigenous people, yeah, well, being an indigenous people depends on two factors, an objective element and a subjective element. The objective element basically has to do with objective futures, such as same language, same culture, same history, same food, but also music, stuff like that. Things that you can objectively identify. But then there's also the subjective element of self-identification. As soon as you start to identify yourself, not in the way as your ancestors did, this special relationship with the ancestral land is affected and then it becomes much more difficult to actually make the argument, yeah, you have the special relationship with the ancestral land, therefore you are an indigenous people. This is somewhat more complicated, but it could affect qualification and then therefore also the application of uh, this huge framework the international law has and all these rights that then apply. Personally, I, I find it very important as well because, for instance, I, I am also from indigenous descent and the indigenous qualification of the lands is Nusaya Ina. So the qualification of the islands is Nusaya Ina, according to, well, the way how our ancestors qualified the land. And still they do within the mountains of Siram. They still qualify the lands as Nusaya Ina and the mother island as Nusa Ina. You come from the Alifur? <coughs> Yeah, I come from uh, the island of Saparua, which is one of the neighboring islands of Seram, from the village of Boy. And also we are from Alifuru descent in that sense. But the indigenous people, and when you look at the customs, you always go back to the mother island. You always go back to, to Seram. You go back to that. You look at, for instance, very particular customs in our culture, futures, you can trace them back to, to the mother island. And it's being practiced over there as well. One particular example is the idea of Pella. Pella is a principle. It's very well known in, here in the Netherlands among uh, uh, the communities here. Being from indigenous descent from over there, also known as the South Moluccans, they also still practice that, that particular custom, Pella. Now, Pella basically means a blood brothership, a partnership between villages. The idea is that as soon as a village needs the help of another village, and if you have a Pella, then you need to help them. But also part of this is that as soon as you marry someone from that village with whom you have a pala, that is forbidden. So you're not allowed to marry someone from a village who is your pala. And this custom is still being practiced even here in the Netherlands. So Crazy. when when we when we go to uh, to events where all kinds of families are, first thing that they but any any auntie or any uncle asks you from uh, who are you from who's your who are your parents from whom are you 
Uh, oh, okay, okay, that's your last name. Oh, from that village, from that village. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, okay, okay. Okay, oh, then you have a pala. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. And this is also very important. Now, in, in our culture, we adhere that, and that also has a spiritual connection because as soon as you breach pala, bad things are going to happen. So, and that, that is still, still being practiced also here in the Netherlands, also over there, this idea of pala. Now, in Ambon, for instance, uh, between uh, 1998 and 2003 or so, there was a, uh, a religious war going on over there between Muslims and Christians. It could have been way worse if not for Pella. Why? Because there were particular villages who were Muslim and other villages who were Christian, but they wouldn't attack each other. Why? Because of Pella. They would even help them. They would rebuild the, the village. Why? Because of Pella. That goes even further than religion in that sense. And that's a very, very strong, very strong and entrenched principle in, uh, in our culture. That's super insightful. Coming back to the Genesis and to the beginnings, I would like to return to the beginning of our interview today, actually to the point of thanking you for coming to our podcast today and sharing your expertise and thoughts. Thanks again, Medes. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. But before we end the episode, however, we promise there will be an exciting surprise waiting at the end. Indeed, we have compiled some voice messages from our listeners from around the world that sent in their observations about the situation of the indigenous peoples from their home country. So without further ado, let's have a listen. Hi. My name is Dani and I'm from Peru. I'm going to talk about the indigenous peoples here. Um, we have more than 71 different ethnicities around here. Most of them are in the Amazon jungle and we have some small percentage around the Andes. There are lots of different languages as well that they all keep speaking and keep alive. One of the main issues that they face is the illegal mining and the illegal oil extraction in the Amazon. So basically, whenever there's a project of legal mining and oil extraction in the Amazon, the only entity that has some kind of representation for the indigenous peoples is the Ministry of Culture. And by law, all of these projects have to be approved by the Ministry of Culture. So the Ministry of Culture has to protect the indigenous communities and has to see if it's beneficial for them also to have these kinds of projects around them. And they have to also say, for example, this certain area is untouchable because they live here and they are settled here. So there is no way that you can do some kind of really extensive excavations, for example, for mining or oil. Um, extraction. The problem that the indigenous communities face is that there's lots of illegal mining and illegal oil extractions. So what happens is that they feel in danger to come forward to the authorities and sometimes they even have to help out, if you can say that, because they don't really want to, they just have to help out to these illegal miners, they have to aid of the work like that's what happens commonly and it's really sad because they're they're doing this just out of being scared of of dying or like getting hurt i really think the indigenous communities should be more protected and should be more taken in consideration because there's like 25 percent of peruvian communities like peruvian population are part of indigenous communities and this has to change there is no representation in the government there is no representation in the laws. There are some projects that are trying to make two different parliaments and one and in both of them there has to be some kind of representation of indigenous peoples. So hopefully indigenous peoples will get more representation in the government and more representation in general because lots of Peruvians and Latin Americans just neglect their communities because they don't vote or participate in the city as we know it, but they have a bigger role to play. They are the protectors of the Amazon, they are the protectors of the Andes, they know what's up there, and we have to take in consideration everything that they have to say, they've been there longer. 
so yeah that's indigenous people from peru if you have any questions you can contact me if you want Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the people of uh, the creators of this podcast for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about my country. My name is Oscar Pineda, and I was born in Guatemala. And as some of you might already know, Guatemala is a pretty diverse country, uh, not only for its resources and nature, but also for its people. According to the national census carried out in 2018, almost half of the population is considered to be indigenous. Also, according to uh, the statistics, 75% of the indigenous population live on the, uh, under poor conditions. And while there might be numerous causes for this unfortunate outcome, it is inevitable to not to mention one which is uh, extremely connected with the um, judicial system of the country. Based on this diversity and pluralism, the Constitution does indeed provide, until a certain point, a, certain, uh, a series of provisions to which they are not only recognized, but uh, protected. For example, one of these provisions guarantees the conservation and enforcement of their own political, social, economic, and judicial institutions. That would mean that indigenous groups are entitled to enforce their own criminal law based on their customs. Um, the latter could represent a series of issues and that have been already s subject of discussions. Following this logic, um, that would mean that potential perpetrator, indigenous perpetrator of a crime could face a risk of being punished uh, twice for the same crime. One being by the application of the customary indigenous law, followed by the application of criminal law by the state as we normally know it. I must also mention that the judicial organism of Guatemala is not prepared to provide the proper conditions to indigenous people when they are faced by a judicial process. While it is true that the right to access justice is a human right and is provided to all citizens in Guatemala, indigenous people sometimes struggle to exercise it. Hi, my name is Lois and I'm from Tanzania, where we have about 125 to 130 different ethnic groups, at least officially. Bias aside, I've always found Tanzania to be a bit unique because despite the fact that we do have a fairly wide variety of ethnic groups, you don't really see any blatant forms of prejudice towards a particular group. Like I myself, I'm from four different tribes and outside of a colloquial context, it's rarely been a defining factor in how I've experienced Tanzania. Um, the Maasai are probably the most active indigenous population back home and a lot of them have migrated from the north and can be found quite literally in every corner of Dar es Salaam, which is our most urban city and where I grew up. I will say though, back home nationalism does come before tribalism, so it's pretty uncommon to see someone weaponize their tribe. But admittedly so, um, I myself do get confused as a Tanzanian because on the one hand, I see Maasai's who have been able to actively participate in the broader community by bettering their lives and sharing their culture through tourism. But then on that same note, you have instances where the government um, is trying to evict them from their villages for tourism. So it does get a bit confusing, but I will say that for the most part, the Maasai are very active in Tanzania. I would have to say, especially in Dar es Salaam, Zanzibar, or Arusha, where there's more opportunities for them to commercialize their culture in a sustainable way, of course. <laughs> but apart from that, I would say the biggest pushback that they receive or form of prejudice that they encountered, at least until present, is from the government trying to evict them from their villages in the Ngorongoro area. Um, for tourist purposes, which is a bit counterintuitive considering that they're the same group of people who do bring in a lot of tourists because of their nomadic lifestyle and obviously the intrigue um, from the international community. Greetings, Sedlex Dudelex podcast. I'm Lila and I study law and politics at the University of Windsor in Ontario, Canada, and I respectfully acknowledge that I live, work, and study on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Patawatomi. The land was stolen from indigenous peoples, and these cities were built with stolen indigenous African and black labor and resources. The insight that I'll share today are my opinions informed through my lived experience as an African diaspora woman of East African descent that has lived in seven countries, my relationships, and my intersectional anti-colonial research. In respect to indigenous peoples and nations around the world, each unique, 
The fundamental point is that we have a distinct culture, language, and history that transcends geographic borders premised upon being the first, the earliest known inhabitants of a particular region with collective ancestral ties and our intimate connection that is inextricable to the land and natural resources encompassing an environment that supports our physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. It is imperative to preface that indigenous peoples are not monolithic or unidimensional. Therefore, the language we use needs to be respectful and informed. This is an invitation for all listeners to learn about indigenous knowledge systems and advocate to indigenize our education systems for meaningful representation and truth telling. In Canada, the Huron-Iroquois word for village or settlement, present-day Canada, Section 35 of the Constitution Act recognizes three distinct Indigenous peoples, the First Nations, the Inuit, and the Métis. However, the relationship between Indigenous peoples and Canada as a settler colonial state has and continues to be paradoxical. The Indian Act of 1876 is one of Canada's oldest legislations that legalized cultural genocide through residential schools and state-sanctioned violence and still perpetuates that violence today. In solidarity with Indigenous peoples, we exist, we resist, and we rise. Before we finish, we once again would like to thank everyone who participated in this episode. And we would also like to thank our listeners for being here with us. Now that the holiday season is starting, we would like to thank everyone who supported Dura Lake Said Lakes this year and who tuned back in every episode. This will be our last episode for this year. However, do not worry because we will be back as soon as we can. And actually, we know that there is already some really cool and exciting episodes in preparation for next year. Our team wishes everyone amazing holidays and the best of a new year. And of course, we hope to see you here at Duralek Sedlex again in 2023.